quickly and jerkily in all directions. Man, I gave you... But Lennon always said he could never have done it without the woman at his side. Her name was Yoko Ono. <laughs> After Lennon and Yoko signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, Russia withdrew from Prussia, the Croats quit Crete, the Bolts bolted from Bolivia, and out of Iraq, a crack attack force of berserk Turk Gurkhas advanced to the Suez Canal without passing Goa. <laughs> the Great War was over, and the world moved on. In America, a new form of popular music drove the entire population wild with excitement. The Jazz Age had begun. A feature of the Jazz Age was the introduction of the new drug, cocaine, which was at first available only in very small amounts. <laughs> but the biggest remaining challenge for technology was the solo flight across the Atlantic. Britain got in first with a solo flight by Alcock and Brown. When it was realized that two men was one man too many to qualify as a solo flight, <laughs> Alcock made a typically British gesture. I'm going outside, he said, and I may be some time. <laughs> but Britain did have an aerial transport success with the launch of the first business class express check-in service. Passenger Brian Cheeseborough said, it's a marvel. I could leave my front door at 8.30 and be in hospital by noon. In 1924, to the grief of the Russian people and lovers of democracy all over the world, Lenin died. His corpse was embalmed so that it might be worshipped in perpetuity. Ordinary Russians queued all day to pay their respects, although many admitted later that they had joined the queue in the mistaken belief that a whole cabbage had arrived from Finland. Queuing became a way of life for Russians. Entire queues would go on skiing holidays together in the Urals. In the 1920s, the US government introduced prohibition, a total ban on the consumption of alcohol. As the final closing time approached, the American people showed their complete agreement with the government's policy. Booze, we can take it or leave it, they said. There was money to be made from Prohibition. People would pay anything for bootleg liquor, a beverage made by boiling a boot and stirring it with a leg. <laughs> the result was the rise of the gangster. The most successful gangsters were Al Capone, John Dillinger, Babyface Nelson, and Lucky Luciano. <laughs> the result was the Great Depression. The whole world grew tremendously depressed. In Italy, the chief scout lost so much money he had to sell his uniform, which had an unfortunate effect on his first visit to Ascot. Al popolo italiano, perché te ne ricordi in ogni tempo e in ogni circostanza di pace o di guerra. The German chief scout, though, fought tirelessly to keep up his nation's morale. Hi, my name. Britain was less depressed than other countries because of the achievements of the England cricket team, which invented a way of stopping the Australians without infringing the principle of fair play. The Australians were led by Don Bradman. Bradman employed the underhand tactic of hitting the ball really hard with a bat so that the English fielders had to run a long way to get it back. England's strategy for stopping Bradman, called body line, was simple but inspired. It was to render Bradman unconscious by launching the ball from a low-flying aircraft. <laughs> it was found that when the Australian players were rendered unconscious, their scoring rate dropped a little above that of the England players. <laughs> British depression was further lifted by the biggest entertainment success of the 1930s, the abdication crisis. It all started with the then Prince of Wales. He was a handsome young man called David, and therefore known as Edward. <laughs> Assuming the name King Edward VIII in order to avoid press attention, the Prince wanted to marry an American woman called Mrs. Simpson.
Mrs. Simpson said that as a member of one dysfunctional family, she couldn't wait to join another. The abdication crisis was over, but in Europe, the Munich crisis had begun. Britain's Prime Minister Chamberlain returned from Munich with proof that Hitler and Mussolini had shared a double hotel room and the bill had been paid by an Arab arms dealer. <laughs> Hitler's response was to launch World War II, but for the tyrant who had terrified Europe, life wasn't all marching into Poland. There was time in Hitler's life for romance. <laughs> Hitler promised his mistress, Eva Braun, that when he conquered England, she would have her own gardening show with Alan Titchmarsh. <laughs> First, Hitler had to win the Battle of Britain, but he had reckoned without the British people. At first, British men were reluctant to enlist, but the government had a secret weapon. Its name was Gracie Fields. King as we go, and then the world goodbye. Singing Gracie was sent out to sing at ordinary people. They immediately volunteered for service anywhere, as long as it was abroad. One soldier wrote home, it is good to be here in North Africa. Yesterday we heard a terrible scream and we thought it might be her again. But thank God it was only a diving stuka. Singing as it went, the crack Gracie Fields division crossed the Rhine. The German army scattered, clutching its ears and dropping its weapons. <laughs> Traumatized, Hitler had to admit defeat. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Emperor of Japan, facing the prospect of Gracie Fields being dropped on Tokyo, suggested to the Japanese people that instead of conquering Asia by military force, it might be a better idea if in future they concentrated their energies on making a very small item of personal electronic equipment for the world market. He asked for suggestions on what it might be called. <laughs> the war over, nothing could stop the Americans. They had teenagers. And the teenagers had a new kind of dance music that spelt sex and freedom. It was the untamed sound of youthful rebellion. It was rock and roll. If I knew you were coming, I'd make you cake, make you cake, make you cake. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked you cake. How'd you do, how'd you do, how'd you do? <laughs> rock and roll marked the start of a new Elizabethan age of British achievement to which the young queen and her husband Philip soon made a significant contribution. It was a baby called Charles. At first the Duke, who had led a restricted manly life, did not know what a baby was. This chap is much smaller than anyone I knew in the Navy, he said, but I know it can't be a dog because it hasn't got a bird in its mouth. The question arose of where Prince Charles was to be educated. The Duke, told that Colditz was no longer available, <laughs> chose his own old school, Gordonston. The Duke was not aware that the strict institution of his youth had been modified into a modern, progressive, co-educational establishment. Female pupils were impressed by their new schoolmate, Charles. Gosh, he's darling. What a physique. <laughs> Charles joined the Navy, where he was the Navy swimming champion. And it could be said that the Navy swimming team's rigorous training methods made a man of him. <laughs> From then on, the stalwart but sensitive heir to the throne became the world's most eligible bachelor. Beautiful women would run up to him and make improper suggestions. Suggestions like, why don't you move out of your mother's house? I can't believe my ears, he'd say. Neither can I, they'd reply. <laughs> In 1961, German TV launched its prototype version of the popular TV show Changing Rooms, Changing Roomen, in which East and West Berliners were given two days to redecorate each other's half of the city. <laughs> the West Berliners disappeared into B&Q and never came out again, 
whilst the East Berlin team went for a radical new look and put up an attractive dividing wall. Britain had the biggest export publishing success of the 20th century when everybody in China bought the same British book. It was Delia Smith's Cooking for One Billion. <laughs> the vigour and creativity of Britain in the 60s was marked by the sensual opulence with which the ruling classes dressed. Prime Minister Harold Wilson caught the world's imagination with his dynamic playboy image. <laughs> Typical of Wilson's swinging approach to government was his choice of female cabinet ministers. Transport Minister Barbara Castle. <laughs> Education Minister Antonia Crossley. <laughs> Defence Secretary Georgina Brown. While Britain swung, America was reduced to cheap publicity stunts, such as flying to the moon. Easily impressed, the world thrilled to the exploits of a man called Armstrong. This is Houston. What do you see out there? I see trees of green. Britain's own space venture was a triumph. <laughs> After orbiting for several seconds over Swindon, British astronaut Frederick Blades splashed down safely in the sea off Western Supermare. He was given a hero's welcome by four ecstatic cod fishermen. <laughs> Astronaut Blades said, that's one small step for a man, one even smaller step for me. Here, hold my handbag. <laughs> After almost a thousand years of mutual suspicion, Britain's relationship with France was at last clarified when Britain's charismatic new Prime Minister, Edward Heath, addressed the French people in their own tongue. Sont au premier plan de la scène politique européenne depuis des siècles. Mais ce n'est que rarement est là que leur point de vue se sont rejoint. The 70s were a great period for British television. BBC star personalities enchanted the world. In Cuba, bearded, virile botanist David Bellamy was made president. La cuestión acerca de si es la lucha armada es el único camino para la liberación. Lo que puedo responder es que, por lo menos en las condiciones de nuestro país, the end of the Cold War in 1989 was marked in Germany by a special edition of Changing Rumen. This time, the East Germans had the bright idea of knocking through to form a stylish, open-plan, post-communist republic. <laughs> As a thousand years of history neared its end, Europe was at last united. Britain, never afraid to buck the European trend, fell apart. England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland went back to being separate countries. Prince Charles brilliantly kept the alliance together with a rousing speech to the new Scottish Parliament. Mair gwraidiai yn dwn. Gwraidiai o fyd hanes a thref yn tynu e rhythm o fyd hanes a threfyddiau. But as time ran out towards the year 2000, a new golden age had begun, the age of Blair. Blair would lead the British people out of drudgery, misery and servitude into a new millennium where every family would have a 400-foot Ferris wheel and a dome of their own at the bottom of the garden. <laughs> at the end of the millennium and at the beginning of a new dawn, what could be more fitting than to meet the man with his name on the Blair era. Nothing's impossible. I have found, but when my chin is on the ground, I pick myself up, dust myself off, 
I start all over again Don't lose your confidence if you slip Be grateful for a pleasant trip And pick yourself up, dust yourself off Start all over again Work like a soul inspired Till the battle of the day is won You may be sick and tired But you'll be a man, my son Will you remember the famous men who had to fall to rise again? So take a deep breath, pick yourself up, start all over again. Nothing's impossible, I have found. I run my chair, it's on the ground. I pick myself up, dust myself off, start all over again. Be grateful for a pleasant trip And pick yourself up, dust yourself off Start all over again Work like a soul inspired Till the battle of your day is won You may be sick and tired But you'll be a man, my son Will you remember the famous man Who had to fall to rise again So take a deep breath Pick yourself up Start all over again Nothing's impossible I have found for when my chin is on the ground Oh, they got it For all that I bet So, oh yeah, we have a nice Don't lose your confidence if you sleep Be grateful for a pleasant trip Pick yourself up, dust yourself up Start all over again